It's really good to be here after uh, so many, many months of having our worship uh, virtually. And then now here in the sanctuary. And hopefully very soon, as we rotate our different uh, congregations in, to have an in-person slash uh, virtual worship. But it's good to be together and to know that God is doing some amazing things, that the body of Christ is really not just based on the physical uh, building, but it's really in the relationships that we have. And I hope that this is a really rich time that we can come to strengthen us as the body of Christ. So here we are in our missions conference, and it's time to focus on world missions. And so as I bring the word this morning, I want to ask this question of um, what are the buzzwords of 2020? Things like, uh, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's been canceled, or that's been postponed. Or yeah, we're all working from home, and they're all studying online. Or uh, maybe this, hey, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I have back-to-back Zoom meetings, or saying that we are just totally Zoomed out, you know? And I've heard some of the youth say that this is really the Zoomer generation because we seem to be doing so much of our life through that in a virtual way. And really, due to COVID, so many things have really changed and probably may never be the same. And we have so many things that we have planned and trips. How many of you have things that you scheduled in 2020 that just didn't happen? Things that you may have sought to do. And many things that are left unfinished. And so many things that we may have planned to do at this time seem to be really up in the air. And you know, in another season that's really been on our minds and our hearts is really seeing how many of our, the older generation before us, as they're getting into this older stage, uh, many of our peers that have uh, elderly parents seeing that they are passing away. And just a clear reminder that life is moving on in so quickly. And that no matter what we have uh, achieved, accomplished, accumulated, the things that we may hold tightly to, that none of us can take anything with us into the after, after we pass away. That those things really uh, will remain here. And that really the finality of death is just seared in our hearts and minds. That even with medical advancements, we might be able to live a few years longer, but eventually our bodies will fail us. And then we eventually, all of us, at one time or another, will, will pass away. And this is really something that's been very clearly on my mind. So if I can use this rope here to reflect and represent eternity. Eternity past and eternity in the future is a very long time. And if we look at this here, that this little green part re- represents our life on Earth, perhaps 80 to 100 years. And that while we're here, eventually, at some point, we will pass away, and then we will go into all of eternity. And for those of us that have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and have made that decision here in our life, we will be in God's presence for all of eternity. But for for those that have not heard of Christ and have not come to know him in a personal way, they in eternity will be separated from God for all of eternity. And the decisions that are made here in this life will have an impact for all of eternity. And that's something that I think is quite uh, important for us to consider as you talk about world missions in the context of eternity and asking that question of what decisions do we make in this part of our lives. And one thing that's really important to note is that while we're in eternity, you can't change your mind. The things that happen in eternity, many of that is actually made by decision that is made in our life here. And Jesus tells a story, which I'll just read briefly to you, about the rich man and Lazarus. And in this rich man, the rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, being in torment. And this rich man, he lifted his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger and to cool my tongue, for I am anguished in this flame. So this rich man, while he was on earth, he really enjoyed so much of his his earthly pleasures. And he did not concern himself with the needs of other people around him. And this rich man focused so much on the things that he had and enjoying his present life that he did not consider eternity. And because of his decision here, it had an impact on his eternal destiny. 
And it's important for us to realize that many of the decisions that we make in our life actually just have a consequence in our life now. And we don't think about the questions and the decisions that might have an eternal impact. And I think culturally speaking, that we generally like to take the safe route. We like to, to have the least risk and to choose the things that would give us the most stability and comfort and security in our life here on earth. But we may not be thinking about taking a path that would be risky, to do things that would, would cause uh, uncertainty in our future, that we do want to have our best life in this, in this current life on earth. And that tends to be our cultural uh, tendency. If we look into our uh, passage this, this morning, it's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. In Matthew 16, we come here to see what Jesus is saying for, to his disciples of what it means for us to follow and to be his disciple. In Matthew 16, verse 21, it reads, And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is amazing to consider uh, when Jesus he began to share with his disciple about his suffering that he would very soon endure a lot of suffering and he would uh, be killed. And then right away, you know, Peter in his, um, uh, in his response came to take Jesus aside, to rebuke Jesus. And he said, this will never happen to you. And so as Peter comes to take, uh, to, to come alongside quietly, to rebuke Jesus. Jesus then speaks up in front of everyone, and he calls Peter Satan. And he says, and he says, you are a hindrance to me. You are a stumbling block. You're getting in the way of God's purposes. See, Peter could not imagine the suffering. He couldn't imagine the difficulties and the loss of status that Jesus would have. That wasn't in his plan. And Peter could only focus on the very present of what he saw and the hope that they were placing in Jesus. And so, so much of his, his mind was on the things of man and not on the things of God. But you know, for the disciples, they were the ones that also didn't understand. It's not just Peter that didn't get it. Also the disciples, they were also thinking of the things of man. And that in, in, this, uh, in this passage in chapter 17, they go to Galilee, and in Galilee, Jesus says, I'm going to be betrayed, and then I will be suffer, I'll be arrested, and then I will be put to death. So when they said that, the, the, the disciples are greatly distressed. But right after that, in Galilee, they went to Capernaum. And right in Capernaum, the disciples are arguing and says, you know, Jesus, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You can imagine that. Jesus just said, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be suffering, and they're discussing, well, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? They still had the things of man in their own mind. They still didn't quite get and understand the bigger plan that God had. And so the things of God, oftentimes, they are not here in this part. The things of man are in this part of life. The things of God are often eternal. And sometimes it's difficult to then fully embrace and understand. And then if we come to regard that this part of our life is so important, it's going to be very difficult to embrace the purposes of God in all of eternity. In this next uh, part of the passage in Matthew 16, verse 24, then Jesus comes and Jesus told his disciples, this is what it means to, to really follow me. He says, if any, anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And Jesus spoke very clearly here of what it means to be a, one that follows Christ, what it means to be a disciple and to have this uh, submission to Christ. 
And this says that if you want to be my disciple, you have to come and deny yourself. Now, deny yourself. What are the things that he's wanting? He's saying, deny your own ambition. Deny your self-preservation. Deny your own personal fleshly desires. Or to deny your earthly reputation. That these are the kinds of things that we need to, to really lay aside if we're going to come and follow Jesus. And in Mark 10, there's this, um, this young rich man that comes running after Jesus. And he's so excited to come to see Jesus. And this, this young man comes up and he says to Jesus, what uh, can I do so I can inherit eternal life? Now think about this. This man's already very rich. He has a lot of possessions. And of all the things that he could ask Jesus, he's a rich man asking, how can I inherit eternal life? How can I have even more? And he comes to say this, Jesus states the obvious. He says, you come and obey my commands. And, and, and this young ruler, he interrupts Jesus, well, yes, I've already done that. I've obeyed all of these things. And Jesus says, one thing that you lack. And he says, sell, go and sell all that you have. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And this rich man was very disheartened, and he went away sorrowful because he had so many possessions. And you can see that this, this young ruler, he in this life had so much an abundance, but he was not willing to let go of what he had here in order to have eternal life and to inherit eternal life. This story actually is a very true story that Jesus actually experienced. But this very true story actually is very applicable to us in our cultural context, in our, our situation, that many of the values, the cultural values that this young ruler had, the values of having a comfortable life, stability, and security, are the same values that many of us in our culture also feel are important. And it was difficult for this, this young ruler with all this wealth to release those things and to allow himself to fully embrace the eternal things, that the present physical things were so important to him. Now, just consider a moment for this rich young ruler that he had so much and he wouldn't let go compared to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a, a tax collector, a man that was sinful, the man that had cheated people. And yet when he saw Jesus, this Zacchaeus was willing, without even being asked, he says, I will give half to the poor. And then if anything, if I cheated, I will pay him back, repay four more times. So you have two people that are rich, and one is rich, and he is righteous, but he's not willing to release his possessions. And one that is sinful, but he sees his sin, he's also very willing to give half to the poor and to, to repay and to, to correct the wrongs. So there's something very different about you know, this whole journey of two rich people, and yet how they come to look at their wealth. So the question I ask today is how tightly do we hold on to our material possessions, to our wealth, to the things that we have accumulated? Are we able to release them for the purposes of eternity, for God's purpose? You know, how much more do we need to still accumulate to have that we will feel the sense of security versus embracing our trust and reliance in God so that we can release resources for eternal purposes? So Jesus is saying here, if you want to come after me, you deny yourself. And the second is this, to take up his cross. So what is that cross? That cross is the things that uh, will bring suffering or perhaps shame. Uh, the cross is, is different for each person. In some cases, it may be being ridiculed. It could be rejected by our community or by our family. There is a, uh, um, this uh, pastor that I know that when he was very young in his late teens, he uh, made a decision to follow Christ. He went home and told his, his family that he just became a Christian. His father said to him, if you decide to follow Jesus, then you are no longer my son, and you have to leave the house. And so at that very moment, he had to make a choice, and he decided that he was going to follow Jesus. So even as a teenager, he made that choice, and he left the house, and he he accepted the consequence of being rejected by his own father. So each of us will have a different cross, and that will be a situation where we, in following Christ, may have some difficulty that we need to bear. And the question is, are we willing and ready to take up that cross and then to truly follow Christ?
And in, 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 in Jesus' words, he says very clearly that whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, if we try to save and to preserve our life on earth, then we will actually come to lose it. But if we come and say here, but whoever loses his life for my sake, in other words, if we lose our life, we give up our life here for God's sake, for his eternal purposes, then we will truly find it. And that's when we come to truly live, to really uh, allow our lives to be in the fullness when we have lost our life for his sake. So here we are in this missions conference. You're asking, why are we talking about these things? Now, why are we talking about uh, denying ourselves and taking up the cross and following Jesus in the context of a missions conference? It's because I believe that missions is not for those that are designated, you know, just for those that are commissioned out, and those are the ones that will be doing the work of missions. Missions is not uh, occurring just in a remote land somewhere else. Missions is not just going through a, in, in sharing the gospel to different cultures and different languages. Really, we are, ought to be involved, all of us, in the Great Commission work. It's not a, 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 a work that is for certain people and not for us as, as a whole. And that's why I believe that when we talk about world missions, it's not an issue of different location, different culture. But world missions is coming to our submission of our lives, submission to God for his purposes, so that we surrender our lives for eternal purposes. And that's why missions really is for all of us to be involved in, in many different ways. So the theme of this year's missions conference is unfinished. And this unfinished refers to the, the task of bringing the gospel to the nations. And it's still not yet finished. There's still 4,000 different people groups that do not have direct access to the gospel. And so it's important for us to understand this unfinished task and what we can, uh, our role in, in doing that. And I want to share with you about the legacy of the CMA. And to understand that the Christian Missionary Alliance, you know, did you know that we did not start as a church? That the CMA started over 100 years ago. And at that time when it started, it actually started as a mission society to send missionaries out. That in that time, they were, sending, they were formed for the purpose of sending out missionaries, and they formed branches. You know, these CMA branches, they were like uh, small groups in the community. And they came from many different churches. And the CMA came at that time to then pray for the missionaries. And they set up MTI, Missionary Training Institute. And that now, MTI is now uh, Nyack College. And so this is our heritage. This is what was set up. And the first field was to Congo. It was to send missionaries to Africa and to reach the people of Congo that had never heard the gospel. And then from this period of growth, um, we see this from the World War I, after World War I to World War II, that tabernacles were set up to do outreach and evangelism. Because of the Great Depression, there were a lot of people very poor, people living in the cities. So they had these, we, we had set up uh, tents uh, or tabernacles, just made of tents, to come together and to have evangelistic meetings, to share the gospel, to feed the poor. And this was a part of our heritage. And then the Great Commission, the Great Depression during that time, uh, was a period that we actually gave even more money when there was a lack of it. And we expanded to do more missions work during the most difficult time in our history. And then they continued to expand to more fields. But then, after World War II, is when we had um, this evangel uh, evangelical era. And this is the first time we started putting together church buildings to take away these uh, tabernacles that were tents and to have more respectable buildings, and not in the inner city, but in the suburbs. And this is when the period of the CMA grew into the suburbs with uh, a lot of buildings and churches, and then we became the CMA denomination in 1974. So even in this entire time, we were operating as a missions organization, and only in 74 did we become a church denomination. And then we expanded to many different fields. And then from that period, um, in 75 to now, there were many uh, refugees from Southeast Asia that came to the US. And there was also many from Asia and Latin America. And at that time, the CMA made a, a decisive uh, uh, strategy to reach out to the refugees that came and to, the, to those that are from Asia and also from Latin America. So that today, in all of the US, we have 40% of our congregation, 40% of our members will worship in a language besides English. 
and to see the cultural diversity of what we have been able to, to give praise to God for. So you think about now, we have over 400,000 worshipers in the U.S., in the Lions, over 2,000 churches, 40% of them in different languages, and that we collectively give over $60 million a year into the Great Commission Fund. And to say, we have over 7 billion people in the world, and there's still 3.4 billion that are unreached, and that we can try to bring the gospel so that everyone has access to the gospel. And that within this region of the world, in this little rectangular area, which has 80% of the remaining unreached people, is that 80% of our alliance workers are focused in this area. And one very exciting thing to see is that in Congo, which is the first country that we sent missionaries to over 100 years ago, that today there's 1.5 million alliance believers in Congo. Isn't that awesome? To see the heritage and the legacy that our our church, our CMA, started originally, and the first missionaries over 100 years ago was in Congo, now 1.5 million alliance believers. And to see this kind of work continue. And so this is what we are part of, that together, the U.S. CMA, we have over 700 workers serving in reaching 70 people groups based in 142 different cities. This is amazing. I get really excited. You know, we're not just coming to a church that's an alliance church. We are part of a movement that has this heritage in Great Commission and that we're able to see through Kama the resources that we provide to communities uh, that may be experiencing poverty and other kinds of catastrophe, the marketplace ministries where we can send professionals to bring discipling in that context, or of access to to see networks of, of believers that go into the most difficult, unreached parts of the world, or envision the CMA's Uh, short-term missions, be able to bring that experience to understand what God is doing. And through these three streams of serving communities, of bringing different skills to impact the whole person, and to multiply church networks, and then to develop people in leadership. That these are all the different ways that we see that the CMA is using to reach out. So we are part of something quite amazing. That we as the Alliance Church are part of this movement that's around the world. And I think it's exciting that we today can consider what part we may have, whether it's in, in the Great Commission Fund to support the work, to give sacrificially, whether it is to pray and to commit to praying for the work, whether it's to be going and sending workers. You know, we've seen in our, in our church the, the, the history of people that have gone, you know, Pastor Chris and Grace that have gone and served in the Alliance before they came back here and then they went out again, or uh, Philip and Frida, and then the, the service of ministry in Asia is also Teresa, and then Chris and Lydia, and Pastor John and Lorraine, before they came back, also served in Spain with the Alliance. We have this, this real heritage of people from within our body that have also gone out. And then today, Jason and Andy being sent out into Taiwan. So this is part of who we are, and I think we can realize that God is doing a tremendous work. And so all these things that we're doing is really towards finishing the task of the Great Commission, whether it's in the short-term, long-term, financial, or in prayer, whether it's in local ministry that we're doing here or somewhere abroad, that all of these things will come together and have an impact because we're seeking to finish the task of the Great Commission. So what I want to ask today is, what are some of the unfinished tasks that you find yourself doing in your life now? Perhaps if you're a student, you know, you're thinking about, I need to finish my school, I need to finish my exams. Uh, I need to write my thesis. I need to do my dissertation. You have all these things to finish that. Or maybe you're a parent, and you want to think, I need to raise my children to be independent young adults that will follow Christ and continue to love the Lord. Or maybe you're an employee, and you're working for a company, and you're trying to say, I have this project to do. I need to finish these things in my work. Now, of course, if many of you are in IT industry, you realize that the very platform you're working on could be outdated and obsolete in 10 years. So there's a lot of things that we're working on, and we have all these different projects. We might be in a stage of life we need to care for our parents, to provide and to care for their needs. Others of us might be working on a project, trying to finish something in our house, in our home. So all these things that we do have a whole wide range of projects that we're going to be doing. And some of them are very routine. Some of them are very short-term in a matter of years. Some of these things may take several years or a decade and maybe even take a whole season of our life. But the question that I want to ask each of you is what difference will those projects have 
in light of eternity. In other words, if we have so many of these projects and things that we're doing in this life here, which of these projects will have an impact in all of eternity? Or, or would most of those projects have an impact only in this life while we're on Earth? And I have to say that if we take our, our school, you know, I'm sorry for all the students, I'm sure that most parents will agree that your GPA is important, and taking the SAT exam is important, and your AP classes are important. But, you know, as important as the grades are, they won't matter in eternity. When you're in heaven, no one's going to ask you, what was your SAT score? You know, how many AP classes did you take? That doesn't seem to be that relevant, and it won't be there in, in, in heaven. Although it is important here, it doesn't have that impact. And then for the many of the projects that we do in our work, you know, maybe three years from now, that project may not have the same significance as it has, and things will come and go. And so the things that we do in our life, the material things, the, the short-term things, that if we come and we take those things and we allow it to influence others for Christ, then that thing that's so temporal can have an eternal impact. So it, perhaps in a work situation, by bringing the light of Christ in our life and having that light of Christ shine, we can then have a huge impact uh, to impact eternity through the, life of, the light of Christ that shines in our life. So a temporal situation can have an eternal impact. And today, many of us will be bringing our boxes that we have for Operation Shoe, uh, shoe Box. And we packed with all these different goodies inside. And we take these things and we come and we, we're going to commission and pray for them and we're going to send them off. Now, as a child in another part of the world is going to come and open that box, that child will be blessed and encouraged and probably very happy to see these things. So those items or material things can bring some temporary happiness. But if this box of goods helps to point them towards Christ, and they come to know Christ through these things, then this box of temporary items, of material things, will have an eternal impact and make a huge impact for all of eternity. So that's why we need to pray, to pray for this Operation Shoebox and the things that we're putting inside, that a temporal thing can have an eternal impact. And so in our lives today, we have many things that God has placed in our hands. We've received and been blessed in many ways. Can we take the things that we have that are temporal in this life and to allow the things that we've received here to really be leveraged to make an eternal impact? And that's what's really important. You know, um, a few weeks ago, there was a missionary worker uh, that was based in East Asia, and he and his family had to return to the U.S. for some um, unforeseen reasons. So as he was back, you know, he and his wife and the three children, they had a teenage son, and two very young children, so three kids. And they came back and they were going to prepare to just uh, be in the U.S. for a short time and to go to another country and to continue serving and doing missionary work in another country. But this, this man, David, um, he all of a sudden passed away. It was really unexpected. He was 40 years old. He was in excellent health. He exercised routinely and was physically very fit. And yet, for whatever reason, he passed away and um, his plans were to, you know, originally to bring his family to another country and to continue missionary work. And yet, in the midst of his journey, for whatever reason, we don't fully know that his life ended very abruptly. And so the question that I ask today is, are we ready? Are we ready to finish the things that God has placed in our hands? Because we never know at the time when we will need to leave this world. Even in the midst of things to be like we're in the process, it's, it's so much going on, and yet we don't know because the, the timing of our life, all of that is not in our hands. So the question is, are we able to take our focus on the, the things that the Lord has placed in our hands in this life so that we can then finish what we need to to have an eternal impact? And that's most important. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for giving us time this, this, this day to think about the most important things in our lives and the things that you have placed in our hands to finish. We give you praise for the legacy of our CMA churches. And we thank you for bringing us into this CMA community. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to this legacy of world missions, bringing the gospel to the world serving the poor, 
in making an eternal impact in our workplace, in schools, in neighborhoods. Help us, Lord, to reevaluate the type of things that we work on, the things that we're involved in, to help focus our lives, to focus our resources and our relationships to make an eternal impact. And may our lives be spent for your eternal purpose. We pray that you would be glorified through our lives and that you would have your way in us. Help us, Lord, to finish what you've placed in our hands. In Jesus' name.